Hello, everybody. My name's Marnie, and I'm so glad that you could join us tonight with Frankston City Libraries and our Frank Talk with Kathy Lett live from the UK. Now, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land on which Frankston City Libraries operates, the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nations, and pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and future. And I'd like to extend that uh, respect to any other elder, elders of any other Aboriginal communities who may be joining us today. Now, Kathy Lett is a celebrated and outspoken comic writer who, is, who has an inimitable, I can never say this word, inimitable. 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 Yeah, that one. You're going to run at it. Inimitable. That's the one. I'll let that go. Um, take on serious current issues. Um, she is one of the pioneering voices of feminism, our uh, contemporary feminism, and has been making us laugh for 40 years. She first achieved success as a teenager with the novel Puberty Blues, which, of course, as we know, has been made into a film and a mini TV or TV mini series, I should say. Kathy's latest release, HRT Husband Replacement Therapy, is about breaking free at 50, proving women only get better with age. So thank you so much, Kathy, for joining us. Pleasure. Hello, all my lovely friends there. So nice to see you looking well and healthy, safe and sanitised. Just a dirty mind, that's all we've got left. Absolutely. And speaking of that, how are you going over in the UK? How are you entertaining yourself in in the current situation? Well, it was, you know, weird having a novel come out during the lockdown because I was planning to fly out to Australia and I was going to have, um, because it's a, because this is a celebration of women's second act and it's all about women ageing disgracefully and having fun. I was going to have a pool party, be carried in by like 10 gorgeous love gods in sequin budgie smugglers. And then I was going to ricochet around the country meeting all my fantastic female and a couple of men, hello, Brian, readers. Um, and instead, I had to do the entire um, book promotion from this room at one, two, three, and four o'clock in the morning because, you know, you're nine hours ahead of us here. So, you know, I was so despairing about it. But then again, I thought, has there ever been a better time to launch um, a comic novel? Because Laughter is not just the best, the best medicine. It's the only medicine we have right now. You know, if you can laugh at something, it does take the sting out of it, doesn't it? So um, I, I just hope that I, I, I've given you all a few more laughter lines over the last few, few months. But it's been pretty bad in Britain. I know you're having a, a second wave, in little tiny second wave in Melbourne, but nothing compared to Britain. We've had 45,000 deaths. And the trouble was that Boris Johnson procrastinated for a month. So while New Zealand and Australia and Europe was locking down, he did nothing. I mean, anyone could have seen what was coming. Helen Keller could have seen what was coming. And yet he, you know, he just was, he's, he's really just um, a human souffle, a charisma wrapping a vacuum. There's nothing much in there, I'm afraid. <laughs> so it's been pretty grim. But where at the moment London doesn't have a second wave and we're coming out of hibernation a little bit so you know we shall see i'm just think, desperate to get back you know it's, it's at christmas time i'll have i want to i always boomerang back for four months at christmas so i might have to do i'm able to get me out of here just to get <laughs> just to get back to <laughs> back to my homeland absolutely be, chase chase the endless summer yeah even if i have to you know go out and go nads for two weeks it'd be worth <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go too far there. Don't go too far there. Um, now, you were actually meant to join us in May for our birthday party. So we no. had a 25th birthday of Frankston Library being on Plain Street in Frankston, its current location, and you were coming to cut our cake. Oh, so. I know. Another terrible, sad thing that I've missed. And also, happy 25th. How fantastic. So exciting. I will confess we still got cake, so it was all good. We were closed, but the staff still got cake, and that's the main what thing. What kind of cake did you have, like a big book or? It, it, it was, I, look, that would have been marvellous, but with everyone in lockdown, it was just a standard cake with a little bit of um, icing writing on top. So it was beautiful, um, but it wasn't the masterpiece of some sort of sculpture, if you like. If only 2020 was a, 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 you know, a computer and we could, you know, we'd also get viruses and we could shut it down and reboot. We'll yeah, just turn do off. the celebration next year when I'm in Australia. You know, we'll get I'll get Brian there and he and I can leap naked out of a cake or something. That sounds amazing, kind of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Now, Kathy, we are really excited about your latest novel, HRT, Husband Replacement mm-hmm. Therapy. Can you tell us a bit about it? I know I was in laughs all weekend. I was actually listening to the audio book. Um, but where did that story start for you? Well, you know, the thing is, at my age, I'm 61 now. Act surprised. Let's do that again. I'm 61 now. Serious? <laughs> That's much better. Thank you. And I thought at my age, I'd be like, you know, I'd be happy to sit at home crocheting my own bus pass. And I'd feel sort of like an orthopedic shoe, all comfortable and well-worn and unremarkable. Um, And of course, I don't feel like that. I feel like swinging off the chandelier with a toy boy boat between my teeth at all times. And yeah, so I thought, well, I mustn't be the only woman who's feeling like that. But nobody ever talks about that second act for women. Um, I think, you know, for women, life is in two acts. The trick is surviving the, the interval, which is the menopause years, which are pretty grim. You feel as though you sweat so much, you feel like the Gestapo are trying to kind of get a confession out of you. But once you get through that part, it's actually the best time of a woman's life, you know, because you're no longer tethered to the kitchen and um, by your heartstrings and your apron strings. You can cut the psychological um, umbilical cord that keeps you tethered there. And we've got time, money, we've got um, the rocket fuel of HRT, which I love. So, you know, really, it's, it's the time you can go and climb Everest or, or go down the Amazon or, or, or just, you know, put yourself first for a change because mothers always put ourselves last and not let our guilt gland throb. You know, just have this, this. It's the first time in history I think women can really have a second act. And of course, the majority of divorces in Australia are now um, initiated by women. And the peak times are when the last child finishes school and when the, um, when the husband retires. And um, what's happening, I think, is that because we live for so long now, I mean, from honeymoon to tomb can be 50 or 60, sometimes 70 years long. Um, and when, when we live through this menopause and the big change, what happens to women is that our estrogen goes down and our testosterone comes up. So you get a little bit more bolshy, a little bit more strident, you know, a little bit more selfish, a little bit more like a bloke, actually. And what happens with a lot of men is that their testosterone goes down and their estrogen comes up, which is why, you know, I, I noticed even with my darling dad, who was a famous footballer, as he got older, you know, he suddenly got very emotional and would cry in the movies and things. And we were like, wow, Dad, you're getting in touch with your emotional side. But it's really a lot to do with hormones. So a big new area of medicine now is men taking hormone replacement therapy to get some testosterone to sort of keep their mojo. But unless we address that, we're going to see, I think, this silver, um, these silver divorces really becoming much, much more prevalent. So, um, and also after, sorry, well, this is such a long answer to your question. But oh, yeah. after lockdown, Um, we know that in China, divorce rates skyrocketed and the majority of divorces once more initiated by women. And what happens in Wuhan, you know, then the world tends to follow. And I think it was really during that time when we were all quarantining that a lot of women realised how little their their men were doing around the house. You know, for most men, not Brian, I can see Brian, who's obviously a love god, but for most men, you know, um, their domesticity is limited to sort of giving the room a sweeping glance. <laughs> you know, that's about it. And so all these things were really highlighted during lockdown and women are thinking, well, you know, I've got, I've got my kids. He's just like having another child around. I'd be better off without him. So I think unless men start cleaning up their act, they'll be taken to the cleaners. You know, and it's not such a big thing to ask them to help around the house. I mean, it's, it's in their interest because it's scientifically proven that no woman ever shot her husband while he was vacuuming. So no, I think that should be a bit of an incentive, actually. So uh, actually, uh, so I wanted to write a book all about that, about saying to women, you are allowed to have a second act and don't feel guilty about it. It's also a celebration of female friendship because my whole motto in life is that women are each other's human wonder bras, you know, uplifting, supportive, and making each other look bigger and better. And, you know, I, I'm, wearing a hum- I'm wearing a wonder bra now and it's so cool because when you take it off, you wonder where the hell your breasts went. So <laughs> never wonder where your female friends have gone. Cherish each other. Let your cups runneth over with love for each other because we really are a very supportive sisterhood, especially Australian women, I think. So it's a celebration of all of that. Absolutely. And I did find myself throughout the novel, um, when you talk about you know men playing their role in the family um, environment and it not being 
You know, and she said, a man has never been shot while doing the vacuuming or the dishes, I have to say, um, or cooking dinner. So, um, but there were times I would stand there going, no, walk away. No, don't. But what I, what I saw most in your novel were the women really finding their own self-worth. Yeah, that's right. I think that's absolutely true because, as I said, women are always, mothers especially, always putting ourselves last. We take the burnt shop. We never take the window seat. You know, we're, we're always worried about um, our children's happiness and keeping our husband happy. But as I said, as you get older um, and you, you, I think you really come into your true self after the menopause because you no longer care what people think about you. You know, women are brought up to be decorative and demure. And we know all the research shows that if a man and woman start talking at the same time, the woman always pulls back because we're too friggin' polite. But after, after you turn 50, especially 60, you get, it, oh, you get a kind of, oh, screw it, I'm 60 gene, where you really no longer care. And, and also because um, society is so obsessed with youth, especially the youth of women, it does, turn, getting older does give you a bit of an invisibility cloak. And the question is, are we going to use that cloak for good or for evil? <laughs> and I like my girls to use it for evil. <laughs> so I'll just, tell, I'll just tell anyone listening a little bit about the book. It starts off on Ruby's 50th birthday. And um, she's, she's popular and she's fun. And, you know, she's got a lot of, she's got two sisters and everybody likes her. But at her 50th birthday party, she drinks too much. And she gets up on stage and she ends up giving a speech where she tells everybody what she really thinks about them. The yoga mums, the school mums, her very domineering mother, who's one of those mothers who has to go to the vets to get her claws done, you know those ones? And, um, and she also reveals that she's just found out her husband's having an affair and that, that very day she discovered she's got pancreatic terminal cancer. You know, thank you and good night. So the whole place is kind of shell-shocked at what's happened. And chapter two, she wakes up with a hangover and opens the letter that she's got that morning from the doctor saying, we are so sorry we sent you that um, diagnosis by mistake. You're perfectly fine. <laughs> Please forgive us, etc." And she's like, uh-oh. But in her drunken stupor, she, um, she booked a cruise with her two sisters to try and patch up their friendship. So then she makes the, the terrible mistake of deciding to keep pretending she's got cancer so her sisters will come on the cruise with her. But it's not until they get on the cruise, she realizes she was so drunk, she's accidentally booked them on a cougar cruise. I don't know if you know what that is. This, these are cruises that, um, where women my age pay and the young guys called cubs go for free. These are real cruises, most of them leave from Florida, surprise, surprise. <laughs> but I thought what fun I could have putting these three very different sisters on this cougar cruise and the kind of carnal, comedic chaos I, I could wrap around that that premise so I had a lot of fun writing it but but at the heart of it it's also saying to women um you know you are allowed to be happy absolutely absolutely and I, I must say that realize when they realize it's a cougar cruise it's one of my favorite scenes because just the real the real depth of personality comes out of each character um and the real self, I would say, um, the one they've each kept hidden is what comes out. And I absolutely loved it. Now, I loved writing that. I did, I did have fun writing the sex scene between the woman, the 50-year-old woman and the, and the 22-year-old. <laughs> and a nose are man. You, yeah. Are you allowed to say that you, you made yourself laugh when you're writing a book? Or a, a, does that give me love bites on the mirror? I'm not sure. I think that's I a good thing. I think it's a good thing. <laughs> I did enjoy writing that scene. <laughs> well, I enjoyed reading it and I'm sure plenty of others have and will. Now, Puberty Blues could very well be pegged as one of your most famous novels um, and now is crossing generations. I know my generation grew up with it as the TV miniseries. Um, where did the idea for Puberty, Puberty Blues come from? Um, well, really, you know, when you... Uh, there's a big surfing culture I know where you are so you you probably some is probably some of the women watching were surfy chicks and in those days you know we we were nothing more than a life support system to a pair of breasts you know we just sat on the beach um, minding the towel fetching the chico roll and massaging the male ego we weren't allowed to surf for example but when you're young like you have no objectivity about what's happening to you especially then because there was you know there was nothing on tv or anything that, that was out of the mainstream 
So um, it wasn't until I was, so from 13 to 15, I was one of these surfy chicks. Uh, you know, these guys disproved the theory of evolution. They were evolving into apes. Um, but at 15, I started getting a bit of objectivity. I started reading Jermaine Greer, who was rhyming slang for beer in the Shire, where I grew up, by the way. The boys would be like, go get me a round of germs. And so um, in the next couple of years, I started writing a book for the other surfy girls to show, to sort of liberate them, to say that, you know, there is more to you and more to life. So I had no idea it was going to go from, um, I was going to go from non-entity to overnight notoriety. And it was quite a terrifying ride, I'm telling you. But um, I know now that the book, there were two copies of the book sold to every house because, you know, people like two good, lovely Melbourneites like Kylie and, and Danny Minogue tell me they were, at home reading puberty blues under the bedspread with a torch going oh, oh wow this is our these are our peers and upstairs the pair all the, in every house the parents were reading it going oh my god is that my children so we got double sales <laughs> um and i don't and i can see now when i read the book that i was reading hemingway at the time because i because I, I left school at 16 i always joke that the only examination i've ever passed is my cervical smear test but i had to educate myself i'm an autodidact it, Obviously, it means self-taught. It's a word I taught myself. Ha, ha, ha. But I remember um, I was voraciously reading and I'd gone through my Somerset Maugham and my, my George Eliot phase and I was now into Hemingway. So when I read Beauty Blues, I can see the influence because the sentences, everything's short, pithy, gritty, no, no adjectives, straight, raw to the point. But of course, that resonates with young people because it, it, there's no... It's easy to read, and it was so um, so brutally honest about what women go through in that very tribal surfing culture. So I'm very proud of it. It punches way above its weight for such a little tiny book. It's like it's like straight Vegemite, no bread and butter. You know, it's very astringent, um, and it's weird because it's only famous in Australia. When I moved to Europe, I mean, you know, it was kind of a, a relief in some way not to be <laughs> still having to talk about my my teenage orgasms or lack of, <laughs> but I'm still very, very proud of it. And now this one, I suppose, because this is HRT, Husband Replacement Therapy, and I started with puberty because I've bookended my, my literary career with my hormonal upheavals. <laughs> yeah. So there's a sort of, there's some sort of delicious poetic sort of synchronicity to that. Absolutely. Now I do have to ask, given the age you were when puberty blues came out, yeah. how did your parents react? Well, gosh, oh, it's hard to remember how shocking that book was at the time, but, but the seismic, the, the sort of tsunami of horror that went through society about this book. I don't know if any of you remember it, but parent, the generation gap was so vast at the time. It was Grand Canyon-esque. I mean, now as an adult, there's not much my kids would do that I ha haven't done. You know, so the generation gap is more like a little fissure now. But then, you know, parents had no idea, for example, why their garden hoses were getting shorter because, you know, we were cutting them off to use in our bongs all the time. They thought they were shrinking, <laughs> things like that. So my mother's only just told me recently because she was a, um, a headmistress of an infant in primary school and, and very innovative teacher and, and revered in her, in her, by her colleagues. But she's just told me recently how much hate mail she got and anonymous phone calls. Anonymous phone calls were the, the Twitter trolls of their time. And people would ring up and say, Can you call yourself a teacher and a mother? What kind of terrible teacher are you? You're bringing up a slut like that. You know, that kind of stuff. She didn't tell me about it at the time because I would have been so devastated. But my mum is Church of England. My dad's Catholic, both very devout. So I know even going going to their church every week was very difficult for them. They were, they were judged quite harshly. So, uh, yeah, it was. And my dad was very upset. I don't think he spoke to me for a couple of years. We patched up. I mean, he was wonderful. He's passed away now, but he was a gorgeous man. But, you know, it was, yeah, it was a pretty, pretty rough ride. <laughs> yeah, like I had to fasten my psychological seatbelt for a very bumpy ride. But it did launch me off on a career which I've loved. So I've been so, it was, you know, I was so lucky. Absolutely. Now, am I correct in saying you've now written 20 books and 16 bestsellers? Does that sound about right? It does sound about right. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> I'm quite old though. 
<laughs> you, you wrote all those in a year. It's fine. Um, so can you give us an insight? I'm trying to say it's cheaper than therapy. That's the only reason I write. Otherwise, I'd be lying on some shrink's couch making him laugh or her laugh. So, you know, I might as well make a living out of this. It's better to share it with all of us. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, can you give us an insight into your writing style? Are you someone who goes in with a plan or are you a pantser? A little bit of both. I have got frequent flyer pant miles <laughs> because, you know, I do fly by the seat of my pants a lot. And I think, I just think any mother who finishes a novel should just get the book a prize because yeah. it's so much harder for us. When my kids were, when I mean, they're grown up now, but I do have an autistic son, which means actually I'll never be able to cut the psychological umbilical cord. You know, he'll probably live with me forever. But when they're little, um, you know, working mothers juggle so much we could be in the Cirque du Soleil. And you do tend to drop a lot of things. So all my male writer friends, you know, I know like Martin Amos and Julian Barnes and Salman Rushdie and everyone, they'd go to their writing rooms each day and their, their wives would bring them up little sandwiches and say to the kids, shh, daddy's, daddy's working, genius at work, you know. But as a, as a working, as a writing mother, you know, if I got one hour between, you know, you know going to bailing one out of juvenile court and stopping the other one disappearing up the stairs with a babysitter between their teeth, you know, or whatever, parent teacher nights, helping with the homework, etc. You know, you valued that hour and it was so precious. I haven't, I've never had time for writer's block. And a lot of my girlfriends who don't have children who are writers agonise over books for years. But, you know, there's that famous Cyril Connolly quote about the, the, the pram in the hall is the enemy of promise, etc. But I don't actually agree with that because when you have got kids, you so value your writing time. You cannot wait to get back to your desk. So it was chaotic when they were smaller. And I just, you know, I just sort of lived in terror of the deadline and would lock myself away as much as I could in like a, the mad burst at the end. But now, you know, it's, it's, it's a joy that I've got so much time to write. And I've got so many ideas. I want to write a whole series of books for women my age about, um, you know, the, the, about us having adventures, you know, adventure before dementia. <laughs> That's my catchphrase. Carpe the hell out of Diem, because if not now, when? Absolutely. So Absolutely. And I was going to ask, what is next for you? What are you working on right now? Can you give us a little bit of a teaser? Well, I'm, I'm starting a book called, uh, it's, well, I'll just tell you the name of it, and I'm not telling you anymore. It's called Till Death or a Little Light Maiming Do Us Part. That's <laughs> working title <laughs> and it's once more a celebration of, of female friendship but um it's a kind of buddy road movie for women so yeah it's like it's like Thelma and Louise except they're so old they've got orthotics and reading glasses it's it's ophthalmic and Louise <laughs> wonderful <laughs> now tell me out of all your books do you have a particular one that you would consider your favourites? Are you allowed to have a favourite book? Like you can't, like you can't have a favourite child. Are you allowed to have a favourite book? Oh yeah, I mean, I think you always love the one you've just written because it's it's you know it's the freshest and you hope the funniest. But the one I've got a big soft spot for, first of all, is Mad Cows because when I wrote that book, no one had really taken the idea that motherhood's the ultimate fulfilment for a female, that great big sacred cow, and whacked it on the barbecue. You know, everyone was being very earth mothery. This is in like 1998 or something, 99. Everyone was being all kind of, you know, there was sort of being all earth mothers and, and doing, all, doing sort of creative things with Play-Doh and that sort of stuff. But I found motherhood really hard, hard yakka. And I also found it dull. I used to think, oh my, people would say to me, doesn't the time go so, so quickly? And I think, no, it goes really, really uh -huh. slow. You know, sometimes I was so bored, I could see my plants engaging in photosynthesis. Um, and every day I was tempted to put the kids under the sink and the lethal household substances within my own reach. But nobody was really talking about it then. But when I wrote Mad Cows, I thought, Maybe I'm the only mother who doesn't cope. I mean, I don't think that now. I think any mother who says she copes all the time is either lying or taking a lot of drugs. Uh -huh. But when I published that, I was really nervous. But actually, it went on to be the biggest bestseller internationally of my career because I think women was just so relieved to have someone put into words what they were thinking but not saying out loud. And it did kind of kickstart a whole genre now, which we call mummy lit. 
and you know now it's fashionable to talk about how how trying motherhood is but at the time it really wasn't so that was kind of groundbreaking and the other book I loved writing was um which I still love is called how to kill your husband and other handy household hymns <laughs> which was a big bestseller you know again that one that struck a nerve <laughs> So all the men watching this are getting a bit nervous now, but you guys are lovely because obviously you're literary love gods or you wouldn't be joining in on this girl talk. So we adore you already, but there are a lot of Neanderthals out there. You know, we have a pussy grabber for a president. We have Harvey Weinstein type predators in every workplace. We still don't have equal pay. You know, we're getting 75 cents in the dollar. Plus we're getting concussion hitting our head on the glass ceiling and we're supposed to clean it while we're up there. So, you know, I think any woman who calls herself a post-feminist has kept her wonder bra and burnt her brains because we still have a long way to go. But I always say we don't whinge about it, do we, girls? My motto in life is, you know, laugh when the world laughs with you, cry and you get salt in your shampers, which we don't want. But I think women have got a lot to whinge about, starting with being the butt of God's biological joke. I mean, just think of all the things women go through from when you're a teenager and you get taken hostage by your hormones once a month then there's pregnancy where everything swells to sumo wrestler proportions. Then there's childbirth where you stretch your birth canal the customary, what, five kilometers? Then there's mastitis, then there's the menopause, and then just when everything goes quiet, do you know what happens, Marnie? You grow a beard. How can that be fair? I could make like a macrame hanging basket arrangement with what's going on here, especially in lockdown. I didn't like my beard at first, then it grew on me, you know. So, you know, we do have a lot to whinge about. But the good thing about women is when we get together, we can really laugh at that stuff. That's why Girls' Night Out is so therapeutic. And I feel sorry for men when they go out. You know, they, they sort of tell set jokes and make each other laugh. But we never do that. Our humour is much more confessional, cathartic, self-deprecating. We strip off to our emotional undies in about 3.6 seconds. And it's a psychological striptease that reveals all. And it's really funny. I mean, you have to be hospitalised from hilarity when you're with your girlfriends. But it's also a way of bringing us much closer together. So thank God we've got that outlet. And it's not just me imagining that women are funny. Anthropologists say women in all cultures on the planet laugh more often than men, especially in all female groups. Isn't that interesting? So it's definitely, you know, a way that we can strap a giant shock absorber to our brains. And that's what I try and capture in my books. I try and write down the way women talk when there's no men around. <laughs> and also I do try and put into words what I think women are feeling, but might not necessarily have the chutzpah to say out loud. <laughs> so I take a risk sometimes thinking, maybe I'm the only deranged female thinking that way. <laughs> but so far, so good. <laughs> yeah. I can attest you are not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> And I've got three sisters, so don't forget, we tell each other everything. So I've got a kind of good uh, testing ground. Yeah. <laughs> they, that sounding board is there. Yeah, they read everything I, I publish beforehand. It just, and I don't let them check with each other. Like I'll send them a draft and say, don't talk to each other. And they read them. And if they give me the same notes back, I know that I've got to change something. So I'm very lucky to have that. Absolutely. Now, do you have any other beta readers that you like to use? Any other what? what? Any other beta readers? So anyone else that you'll send your manuscript to before it heads off to the publisher? No, only my three sisters. That's it. Yeah, because if you send it to another writer, they'll just steal all your ideas. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, this is ruthless. Yeah. Well, actually, do you know one of the things that I noted most in HRT was um, you managed to get coronavirus in there. I know. And I went, I <gasps> she got it in there. She must be the first one to be published. I think it's the first novel in the world that had coronavirus in it because I was <laughs> doing the proofs. I was correcting the proofs in January and it was on the, you know, it was, it was already on the kind of, um, we knew what, started to hear what was happening in China. So I, I quickly re put all the bushfires in because of course we were living through the worst bushfire, um, it, bushfires in our history. So I put a lot of the bushfires in. I hope you noticed that too. Yep. Did you notice that as well? Coronavirus in there. So yeah, I think I should get some kind of, medal for that <laughs> <laughs> that's an excellent little effort know, little did we know how bad it was going to get so. oh absolutely absolutely but i think in you know five ten years time when people read that it'd be like us reading spanish flu it's something that yeah. happened a long time ago and oh yeah um yeah. and that and that's over there hopefully at that point 
we're now, living through a hiccup of history and uh, yeah it's speed hump been revelatory yeah absolutely now tell me what is the strangest thing that's happened to you in your career strange oh there's so many gosh how can i i think the strangest thing was um when i had julian assange hiding in my attic what <laughs> When I was married to um, Jeffrey Robertson, and, and we're still really good friends, by the way, but when I was married to Jeff, he's a human rights lawyer. So we often had a lot of interesting people staying in our attic. Like we had, Sam, Salman Rushdie was up there during the fatwa, not for long, but he was there. It's more of a thin one now, I'm happy to say. Uh, with James Hewitt. Remember the, the guy who had the affair with Princess Diana? Oh, yeah. James Hewitt. He came here for advice. He was smuggled here in the boot of someone's car. Um, and so he came from, because the palace wanted to put him on trial for treason, because it's Jeez. treason to have an affair with the with the, the future Queen of England. Um, and then I also had Julian Assange. He, I've had it, I always joke that I've had everyone in my attic except Anne Frank. And I love Anne Frank. I think she would let me make that joke. <laughs> I hope she would. Um, but anyway, he was up there for a while. Then I got to know him so well that when the Simpsons were doing their 500th episode, they rang me up and asked me if I would write his dialogue. So, I mean, for any writer to get a credit on The Simpsons is like the ultimate accolade. <laughs> so I did write his dialogue for that, which was, a, that was like the weirdest and most wonderful thing that happened, I suppose. But um, they cut my favourite joke. I had a joke where Assange is, uh, he's doing a barbecue and Marge Simpson comes over and she tries the, the marinade, which she loves. And she's like, oh, Julian, I really want that recipe, to which he replies, I'm sorry, but I never reveal my sources. <laughs> That's not bad at short notice. But they cut that joke. It's got the other jokes in there. So, and I would say about Julian, by the way, um, I know he's a very controversial character, but to my mind, he's uh, on the autistic spectrum, which is something I know a lot about because of mm. my own son. So that's why he gets into so much trouble socially. You know, he says the wrong thing and he doesn't read situations well, but he's also a computer genius. Mm. And he try and he's been he's always tried to tell the truth. Um, so the fact that he's going he could be extradited to an American supermax for the rest of his life is truly criminal. And I think all writers, all journalists, and all Australians should be really concerned about that and we should be doing everything we can to get him extradited back to australia you know let him use his powers for good you know he's, he really is a genius hmm. but you know terrible what's happening to him now he's in he's in solitary confinement in in a maximum security prison and all he did was publish he didn't steal anything and you know the new york times and the guardian and the, the the Age and the Herald also published his findings. So, you know, then they could be prosecuted. So I think we should be really worried about that. Absolutely. Now, can I just, I don't want to dismiss that because that was obviously it's a very, very serious situation. But can, yeah. I, can I say, your credit on The Simpsons, was that when you knew you'd made it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, in my terms, yeah. I mean, that's better than winning the Booker Prize. <laughs> The other great thing that happened to me, which was also better than winning the Booker Prize, I was made writer in residence at the Savoy Hotel in London. I mean, wow. They gave me a £3,000 a night suite on the river for three months. I mean, the only thing I wrote were checks for more champagne. <laughs> so but, then let's you know, not mention the cocktail. You have a cocktail named after you there. <laughs> well, I do. We've put a lot of research into that, um, obviously, a lot of, a lot of research. <laughs> research <laughs> yeah we've got something called the kathy cassis which is delicious it's um you know champagne cassis strawberries lemon a little bit of sugar um and do you, do you know who julian barnes is is he still a well-known writer yeah so julian barnes was there with me one night we were drinking kathy cassis's and i said to him <laughs> i said i'm really glad i've got a cocktail named after me but I, i'm slightly worried about all the men who can go around town now saying that they've had me and he said <laughs> No, don't worry, Kathy. As long as they say you went down rather well. <laughs> that was so risque. I mean, you know, he's very pinstriped, underpanted, you know. But we, we, we've got a little, I've got my own table in the bar. Anyone watching, if ever you're in London, when after lockdown, after this horrible corona crisis is over, if you're in London, 
pop into the Savoy, I'm in the Beaufort bar at my table, I will pour champagne down your neck. I've got endlessly flowing champagne. But we were there one night drinking. I've got a little comedy coven. Do you know who Ruby Wax is? Is she well known? Yes, As she's Sandy well known here. Sandy Toxvig, who hosts QI, of course. Um, Joe Brand, a comedian, another comedian. Ronnie Ancona. Anyway, this gang of girls, we were there having drinks one night and Tom Jones walked in because it's his favourite bar. And um, <laughs> we'd drunk enough Kathy Cassises to think it might be quite funny if we threw our underpants at him. <laughs> but it was, sadly, it wasn't until I saw the underpants arcing over the bar, I realised they weren't like little lacy G-strings. They were huge, you know. They were like a spinner of a yacht. I'm not telling you whose pants they were, but whichever girl got her pants off first. I thought we were going to get an exclusive then. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> and then suddenly Tom Jones is like asphyxiating. He can't breathe. You don't have to get the defibrillators on him. And uh, when he turned around quite cross, then he, he saw it was us and he just sang us what's new pussycat. So that was really nice. <laughs> I love it. Now tell me, what would you, knowing all that you know at 61, what would you tell your high school self, your puberty blues self? Wear sunblock. I mean, you could play join the dots with my freckles. And what I would say is wear sunblock, you idiot. We used to put baby oil on and then bake, you know, to get the tan. Um, but I'd also say uh, to those, to myself and my girlfriends, don't wait to be rescued by some knight in shining Armani. Stand on your own two stilettos you know, always have faith in your own ability and don't put yourself second because we definitely, definitely did. So I'd probably say that, yeah. Awesome. And Brian and Susan have actually asked you a question. Oh, I can see them there. <laughs> so if you could have a few moments face-to-face -face with Donald Trump, what would you tell him? Face-to-face <gasps> -face with the comb-over king. Orange would... comb-over king. Yeah, I would probably tell him to grow an extra brain cell because the one he's got must be so lonely up there. I would also probably point out to him, you know, the value of women, not just as, you know, his sexual objects, but actually as human beings. And then I would probably use his testicles as maracas. Or would that be too enjoyable for him? Oh, God, oh, let's not even go yeah. there. <laughs> I know it's, it's it's too horrific, isn't it? I mean, oh, the fact that he I said I was, reading, I was reading about him recently, where he said that women, once women hit thirty-five, they're past it. But he'd also once said that his daughter Ivan, is it Ivanka? Yeah, it was is yeah. so beautiful. You know, he, he if he met her, he'd probably date her. And I thought, well, now she's thirty, at least she's thirty-six, so she no longer has to think that you know incest is on the carnal cards. <laughs> I mean, everything he says about women is so disgusting. And yet he gets away with it over and over and over again. And, you know, so does Boris Johnson. And imagine if we had a female prime minister in Britain who had had so many, had had children out of wedlock, had moved his, uh, the mistress into number 10 Downing Street, had a, ba you know, had a baby, had, oh, you know, all the scandals recently where he was going out with that pole dancer and he gave her, he gave her, you know, money, he took her on international tra trade trips. I mean, no woman would ever get away with one moment of that behaviour. And yet the men, those men, just brazen it out in the most appalling way. But I'll tell you something encouraging. They're saying that one of the ways, one of, they know that with the coronavirus, more men are hospitalised and more men die from corona. So they're thinking that the female double X chromosomes are protecting us in some way. So in America, they're trialing, giving men female hormones. They're having a progesterone trial and an estrogen trial. And I thought, if that works, can you imagine all the big hard assed world leaders like Boris Bolsonaro and Trump and Erdogan and others queuing up Putin, you know, queuing up to get female hormones. I thought, wouldn't that be great, a feminization of the world? And of course, it'd be so good for mother nature because, you know, women, mothers, we care about mother nature. So I thought that would also make a great novel, wouldn't it? <laughs> they no longer, you know, if you had female leaders, they wouldn't be worrying about missile envy. Who's got the biggest missile and that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I think that would be a very great thing. <laughs> I'll keep you posted on that. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Now, Lisa has asked, when international travel starts again, what two writers' festivals would you love to attend and why and any other festival or event? 
I really want to get back to the Melbourne Literary Festival. They're tied in with the Sydney Festival, I know, but that's always the most fun because Australian women, I think, are the world's best kept secret. Funny, feisty, frank, fiercely loyal. I mean, every time I, I go to an event in Melbourne, and Sydney too, or anywhere in Australia actually, you just want to go out with all those women afterwards to the bar and just cackle like kookaburras for hours. You know, and I really miss that because I get a lot back from those events. Because a lot of my female readers in Australia, they bring me up little anecdotes they've saved up for me, like a little doggy bag. They'll go, oh, this happened. I thought you'd find this really funny. You know, and I'm writing them down. You know, they often turn up in novels. So I would definitely be racing back to get to the Melbourne Literary Festival. And um, where else do I, well, there's a, you know, there's a literary festival in Bali. How good is that? I mean, who doesn't want to go there? So yeah, I'll have to angle, I'll have to angle and wrangle to get to that one. <laughs> oh, that sounds good. I, I think the sound, the actual thought of international travel again sounds good, regardless of where we go. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm a travel writer as well for the Telegraph in Britain, which is not owned by um, Murdoch. It's a different, it's a different newspaper. But this year I was supposed to be going to the Galapagos, Machu Picchu. I was going to um, Uganda to see the giant apes. You know, I was going to a nudist colony in Greece with one of my sisters. Now that would have been funny. That's a new book. <laughs> <laughs> so, I know. So I had all these amazing trips planned. In fact, when um, the Corona crisis started, I was doing a travel story for my column in the Whit Sundays. I was sailing with my three sisters. We were learning how to sail, which was hysterical. But remember those Japanese soldiers who came out of the jungle in the Philippines and they didn't know the, the war had ended? Well, we didn't know the war had begun because we were out of radio contact for a week, sailing. And when we got, we got back and suddenly there were toilet, no toilet paper, there were supermarket queues, they were shutting down the borders. We got the last flight back to Sydney. It was like, whoa. Because remember how it escalated really quickly? Yeah. So that was quite surreal. And then when I got to Sydney, I had to make this... Um, harrowing choice between staying to look after my mum who's my lovely beloved mum who's 89 or boomeranging back to Britain to take care of my autistic son who's 29 but still needs a lot of care and that was a horrible choice to have to make because I knew that if I got back to Britain and mum got sick thank goodness thank goodness she hasn't but you know I wouldn't be able to get back to her bedside so it might be the last time I saw her so that was really awful but anyway Thank, thank goodness she's fine. And we do this, we Skype every day. We do the, the Guardian and the Times crosswords because she's a cruciverbalist like me. And we have it. a great laugh. And yeah, she's wonderful. And she's a big library user. I mean, you know, the library's been a big part of our lives growing up and, and it's a lifeline for her still. So I'm a big supporter of libraries. Obviously, that's why I'm here. Thank you. And we have actually, through Corona, our biggest thing at Frankston City Libraries has been the lovely messages that we've been getting from our members, just yes. thanking us for talks like this that we're doing with you or sending them out books or whatever it might be, be that we're doing. And when we reopened, just seeing all our regular patrons again and the smiles on their faces. And we wished we could have given them a hug at a 1.5, you know, we're saying it's a virtual hug. Um, but it's just been absolutely lovely, just the outpouring of, of support, which has been just wonderful. And of course, as we can't travel internationally, you know, flights of fancy are our only mode of transport right now. And of course, a library takes you everywhere. So, you know, it's such a great gift for us all that we have that. We must make sure the government never cut, don't cut our funding and all the rest of it. So, yeah. Absolutely. Now, before we finish up, there's two questions I wanted to ask you. What is the one piece of advice you'd give an aspiring author? And go. Um, just write. Just ha All you need to be a writer is have something to say and an original way of saying it and, and follow your own voice and your own instinct. You know, that, that, that's all you really need to know and keep reading. But I think your first book's are always very autobiographical. So you take your pen, you dip it into your artery and then you write in blood. <laughs> you know? But after that, you may learn to make more of a living out of lying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just write. It's really cathartic. And, um, and yeah, it's, I just love pushing words around on a page. That never gets tired old for me. Absolutely. I always write the book I wish I'd had when I was going through something. I sort of write it for other women coming up behind me, whether it's, you know, teenage, being a teenage girl trying to survive all that, that sort of peer pressure and the sexism 
whether it's being a new mother or you know toddler taming or whether it's raising a teenage daughter or menopause or marriage or divorce or whatever i try and say you know this is what i this is what i've comedically gleaned from this experience and this might sort of this might offer you kind of um you know some kind of psychological safety net <laughs> yeah i do have a quick question from sophia that's just come through uh, she said do you handwrite or type your first draft um i do both i mean i write notes all the time when i'm out and I think of things, I hear things, and but I but I think now of my fingertips. I do. I mean, yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah. But and what is? Write, it's like a muscle. You need to use it every day. So you need to, you know, yeah. So just yeah, that's a boring answer, isn't it? No, I love I it. Do write my sex scenes. I do write my sex scenes in bed though. Ooh. I do. I get put the candle on. I try and get in the mood. You know, you can't just write that in your office. You do need a little bit of motivation. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, well, men always say to me what do women really want in bed I'll tell you boys breakfast breakfast and a really good book which I look I just happen to have did you notice my very subtle product place placement do you see that very subtle I thought dropping my own name <laughs> yeah. I, I tried to put mine above my couch and it just it looked it was there was a lot of reflection off the cover and it just wasn't happening so I can hold it <laughs> Now, what is on your what is what is on your reading pile at the moment? What are your who are your go to authors? Uh, well, actually, during lockdown, I've used the time to catch up on a lot of uh, the classics because, as I said, because I left school so young and I'm, I'm really not educated, so I've I've had a Hoover of the oeuvre <laughs> of Dickens. I've read about ten or eleven Dickens. Uh, Edith Wharton. I've been reading. I've just um, done Anna Karenina, which I've, I've never read, which is, it's long and detailed, but it's like looking at a, a Bruegel, is it Bruegel, is that how you pronounce it? It's very detailed, but I've, I've loved that. And what I, now I've just started on Henry James. So I'm using the time <laughs> to plug up a few holes in my literary education. And it's been a real revelation. I mean, yeah, what all incredible writers. I mean, Dickens just makes you, make what other author makes you weep like that except elizabeth gaskell also mary barton i would highly recommend that she's the female dickens really so yeah that's what i'm doing educating myself <laughs> finally at 61 yeah. <laughs> well thank you so much kathy for joining us tonight we, it's been an absolute pleasure hosting you oh you're so lovely and i wish i could see all those beautiful people i could see a few there if i could click along i could probably see a few more you can check it check them all out hello lovely ones oh it's so nice to see your beautiful faces and there's a few blokes there too oh we do love our literary love gods hello hi everyone waving away well thank you for joining us i hope i didn't look i know i'm such a huge talker i'm like the the mouth from the south my lips lose weight the amount of talking i do i'm so sorry if i Two jury is off, but it was right. my boss is in here, so she'd be like, Oh, just like Marnie. That's <laughs> why so I knew we'd get on Marnie. <laughs> I can see Laura's going like that. Yeah, yeah. that's my boss. <laughs> well, okay. happy reading, happy reading, everyone. I hope HRT makes you laugh, and it's going to be a TV series soon, I think. So, and I'll see you next year. I should have a new book out, so I'll make a I'll make a special effort to come down and see you all so we can meet in person. Cause it's oh, that so... would be so wonderful. Hello, Eric, another man there. Hello, Eric. So nice we've got a few blokes there. Have you started ovulating after this conversation? That's what I want to know. Keep safe, keep sane, keep happy. And, um, yeah, as I said, the only thing dirty about you should be your mind, which is why you should slip between my covers. Satisfaction, guaranteed. Bye, all. Perfect. Thank you. Now, Kathy's books are available in ebook and e-audio across our digital library apps, free with your Frankston City Libraries membership. If you're not a member, you can sign up via our website. You'll find Husband Replacement Therapy in audiobook format on our RB Digital app. You can also purchase Husband Replacement Therapy from Robertson's Bookshop in Frankston, and we will pop a direct link to all of Kathy's catalogue um, attached to this video when we share it across our social media channels. Now, keep an eye on the Frankston City Library's website. We've got some great Frank Talks coming up. And thank you again to Kathy Lett for joining us live from the UK tonight with Frankston City Libraries.